So our final speaker for this session is Tom Waterfield. He's an emergency paediatrician and a research fellow based in Belfast, and he's leading the Peruki study on petechiae in children, which is what his uh, topic is today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I could stop and let you just ask Kerry questions. It might make my talk a bit easier, and uh, I mean, you can all go a bit softer on me. Um, I've also got, Kerry said to me when she got mic'd up, I feel like Brittany, and that's just all I can kind of have in my head uh, since she said that. So yeah, I'm Tom, I am a emergency paediatrician, as you heard, and I work on the PIC study. So the PIC study, uh, particularly in children's study, for me is kind of summed up by the pictures that you can see in front of you. So um, the top left there is a little boy called Ezra. Um, really early on in my peds training, I was involved as a registrar looking after him in our paediatric intensive care uh, I've got permission to use his picture. His family have been on the BBC One show and have done lots of things in Northern Ireland to promote, promote the study and are kind of a really incredible family. So lots of you will have seen children like this, unfortunately. And I think it's really important to remind ourselves that this is what meningococcal disease looks like in children. This is what we want to prevent. This is why we give lots of antibiotics. This is awful. But on the other side, we have the picture of the little girl having, I think, having a blood test. Um, she doesn't look very happy. She's kind of in a headlock. Uh, it's pretty distressing, and it's really hard. If you, you go down from intensive care at the end of that rotation and go and start working in A&E again, and it feels like the, the picture on the right there is kind of what we're doing more of. There's lots of painful procedures. Children who, deep down, you know, how many of us have said, oh, they're fine, we're just having the bloods done. You know, you already have, or, or, or what's happening in the study, we've put Amatop on. This is meant to be a paediatric emergency. We've put Amatop on to wait before we do the bloods. So we're doing these procedures, and we need to balance the two. How do we reduce the harms? must also pick up the children like Ezra. And that's is where PIC comes in. So we've worked with you guys, um, and it's been really, I've been kind of over overwhelmed by the support we've had through Peruki. 37 sites, 1,300 children, um, trying to look at what happens to children when they come in with a non-blanching rash. Uh, what can we learn in terms of clinical features? What can we do with the guidelines that are available? And how can we use things like biomarkers? So before we... Dig in, 90s montage. So uh, I used to love, by the way, Funhouse. That used to be my favourite thing to get in and watch on TV. And I was Blur rather than Oasis. But the reason I've got this up is that actually our practice comes from this time. So 1990s, UK, meningococcal rates were the highest that, we, that we've had on record. So 2,000 cases uh, a year in England alone for meningococcal sepsis, lots of those in children under five. The vaccine, the MENC vaccine, doesn't come in until 1999. So people talk about, and I look, as I get older, I feel like I fit in more and people look younger. But there's people who will not be aware of, you know, you hear about it, meningococcal season, and this idea of having a case every week coming through your paediatric department. So people want to look at the evidence and try and improve what we were doing with fever and unblanching rash. So I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to give you a flavour for the research. So one of my favourites was a study by Mandel et al., 1997, American study, 18 months, one A&E. The reason I liked it was they got everyone, every kid that came in with a fever and non-blanching rash, they included them. Brilliant, because they got the numerator and the denominator. They didn't just get kids with meningococcal and look at what had happened. Two cases of meningococcal. I won't go into it, but the USA at Northern America has low rates of meningococcal anyway. And they said, well, look, the two kids we had in were really sick, so if they're sick with a non-blanching rash, you should treat them. Pretty sensible. That's the start of things. And then here we had um, was a small study by Brogan et al., which was a year or so later, Institute for Child Health. 55 patients they recruited, three meningococcal. And then we had probably the one that I'm most jealous of, the study I would have liked to have done, which is Louise Wells' study from Nottingham. Um, just over 200 children, 24 kids with meningococcal. And what Brogan and Wells came out and said was, well, actually, yes, they all look ill. So I don't know how many of you have heard of ill, but irritable, lethargic, prolonged cat refill, uh, all the sick ones. If they're ill, we should really treat them. But you know what? If, if it's not spreading and they look quite well and they have normal biomarkers, we might be able to send them home or observe them for a little bit. Now, this starts to sound like nice guidelines a little bit. It's kind of building towards that. And then Louise Wells said, well, actually, we've noticed if they're just above the nipple line and they're really well, you probably don't even need to do tests and they can go home. So I'm just going to remind you, that was a patient, one centre, 200 odd patients. How many of you know that bit of evidence? It is our favourite bit of research. We love telling everyone and teaching it. And I think there's some, I probably can't go into it today, but I think there's some reasons for that. I think we like it. It's a really convenient truth, so we spread it. 
And then we have someone's going to say, but what about Andrew Reardon's paper, 2016, 600 odd kids? You've forgotten that one. Well, we haven't. That data was collected in the 90s. Fantastic paper, really, really useful. But if you look, the data sets are from the 90s. But the thing that came out from that, purpura, really high risk. How many of you said, ah, oh, another HSP, we give an antibiotics. In that study, children were taken off of the meningococcal pathway because they had HSP and they had meningococcal infection. So really risky purpura. And I think that's got lost a little bit over time. So anyway, yeah, Lego. I had to get a Lego slide in. Uh, without, I mean, don't forget the bubbles. I always like to imagine this is the one that was lost at sea in Damien's house. But anyway, so we're here to give you kind of a first look at the study, if you like. So I can't, this study's still going on until the end of June. We have research without prior consent, so we will get some of our data coming through over the next few months. So I'm not going to give you uh, guideline validation and, and some of that stuff, but I'm going to give you the messages and the stories and the things that aren't really going to change and probably for you as clinicians will be really interesting and useful. And some of it you'll probably know. So I think most of it you will. So we're looking at about 1,300 children. We've only had 10 decliners. Uh, I'm not going to talk about research without prior consent today. Um, 37 sites, so thank you. And then we're going to try and do the poll everywhere. I don't know if this is going to work or not. But so serious infection, um, I'm going to read your statement, you just tell me if you agree with it or not. So serious infection is more likely if the child has a lung blanching rash and a fever as opposed to a fever alone. Oh, it is working. I thought it wasn't going to work for me. Wow, that's really interesting. So uh, I'm really nice. Uh, I try to be. Um, anyone that says they're nice probably isn't, but I'm trying to, I, this, this, whatever you put on this, you, I can argue that you're right, which is the beauty of research, I suppose. So um, don't change your answers now. So, so yeah, so we had a real mix, okay, so a real spread, which is what I was hoping for and expecting. So this is the only really boring slide in my talk, hopefully. The top thing there, just spend a second having a look at that. So this is the, what we've got so far that I can tell you about data-wise. Invasive infections, so we wrote a protocol and we defined those as PCR or culture from blood or CSF. Um, where people that perform a test are blinded to the clinical data. I can't make this up, is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, we have 16 cases of meningococcal out of rough, in and around 1,300. Two invasive pneumococcal infections, one group A strep, which I think was lower than I would have expected. It feels like we see lots of group A strep, but actually not many of them are invasive. They're just pretty unwell with tonsillitis, probably. And then E. coli, which was a young infant, as they too can get non blanching rashes. So that's our 20 invasive. The plus one is because we've got one that we think might be meningococcal, but I can't tell you it is for certain yet. I need an independent person to look at that because we've got some odd results. Um, you see, I'm biased already. I think it is. I've got to pass it on to someone else to look at it. Now, the next part, before anyone shouts at me or heckles me, other serious infections, I've picked this deliberately just to compare to a data set that's already out there to try and answer that question. So this, um, I don't think they've all got pneumonia. Our median age was two. Some of them will have bronchiolitis. I didn't write the definitions about if you have x-ray changes, you have pneumonia. Please, well, that, we'll, say, we'll shelve that one for another day. Same for UTI. You can have E. coli in your urine and not have a UTI. So, but these are definitions that exist at the minute. So we had a real mix of infections. The reason is, so trying to stick with don't forget the bubbles. If you've not read this um, point of care CRP uh, review that Tessa did, it's really good. But it's about a paper by Verbical et al., which is 2018. And the reason I'm picking that is they had 5,000 kids who came in unwell to A&Es and kind of urgent cares, and they did point-of-care CRP. The reason I'm picking it is there's a really nice recent population that I can compare our non-blanching rash kids to, if you like, to kids who came in unwell. 5,000 children, their median age was just under two, slightly more boys than girls, just like ours. They had one case of meningococcal infection, just one out of 5,000. We've had 16 out of 1,300. And that's me giving you the kind of, that's me assuming all the data comes in and we don't get any more cases. Uh, they had no deaths. We've had two deaths. But the background overall rate of serious infection, if you use the research definitions, theirs was 4.9%, ours was 4.8%. So I could tell you that kids with non-blanching rash, the risk is the same, about 5%. We shouldn't be treating them any differently. It's 5% compared to just kids that come in on well. But I could tell you, actually, the risk of meningococcal disease is through the roof and the risk of dying is much higher than any other data set that we see, which might be a bit surprising to some of you. I don't know. Um, we'll see out the questions at the end. So this is meningococcal disease for me. Okay, it's Voldemort. So like, we want him to, we think we've defeated him. We think he's gone away. Most of us individually aren't seeing very many cases. We don't even really like to talk about it. And actually, 
this is me reflecting on my own practice. I saw, I'm seeing so few cases, starting to think it's almost like a myth. You know, you can tell if they've got meningococcal, they're really sick when they come in. You know, it's, it, it, we're doing too much harm. But actually, it's still out there. It's still a really important, if not leading cause, of kind of infective death in children. And we need to be vigilant for it. So, back to the title, where's Spot? It, that's just to give you the kind of context and where we're at. So how can we spot it? What can we do? I, I want to give you some things. That you've all got guidelines out there, and I know you don't follow them because I've looked at the data. So I know that only one in 10 children, I probably should tell, about one in 10 children are investigated as per NICE. Of those that NICE said that you should treat, you're treating about half of them. So you're not following the guidelines. So if you're not going to follow the guidelines, let me help you a little bit. So purpura, we only had 73 children out of 1,300 with purpura. Okay, so how many of you see purpura regularly? It's not common. So that's something to hammer in. I get it all the time. There's a kid in the department with a non-blanching rash. Are there purpura? No. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean there's nothing wrong, but it changes that risk instantly. That should be the first thing. We have a purpuric rash. It's very different. Twelve of the cases of meningococcal were in children with purpura. So I would treat any child with purpura and an intercurrent illness with antibiotics, even if I thought it was HSP, which is a change in my practice, because actually, why would you take the risk? And go back to Andrew Reardon's paper, there were, children, there were doctors, senior pediatricians who would, someone's going to be, in, who's going to know this case or whatever now, but who have taken children off of meningococcal pathways because of HSP. It's a tiny number of kids that have purpura and are unwell, have an intercurrent illness. Just treat them. Spreading particular rashes. So most of you in the context of a febrile illness would probably treat a spreading particular rash. What spread? Again, we could discuss that at length. But three cases. So now we've got the other three cases, if you like, 15 out of our 16 cases. That you might say that doesn't sound too bad, but actually it's, it's, it's over 1%. If we only had one case out of 5,000 in children that are you know, just unwell. I remember Belgium is very similar to us. They have the men... Um, they have the MenB vaccine over there now, so it's, it, it's part of their, their immunization schedule. So we're not, we're not miles away in what we're doing. Um, that's a hugely increased risk compared to just normal children that are coming in unwell. And actually, I've got kids. If I said, uh, you know, it's just over 1% whether they're going to have a life-threatening, life-changing infection, we're just not going to treat them today, I'd probably say, no, I'm, I, I think actually you will treat them, and I'm going to become a really difficult parent if you don't, which I can do really well. Um, now, non-spreading particular. So this is where things start to get. If you're going to not follow the guidelines, which I can't advocate that you do, but I know that you don't do. Um, we have one case with a child that had a non-blanching rash that didn't spread in the context of a febrile illness. Uh, and that child looked unwell. So this, but you're starting to get, you know, well, wellness is hard to assess, but one. So, so this is what I want to try and take home, is if they've got purpura from now on, hopefully you'll treat all of them, even if you think it's HSP. So I think the next one's a question for you. Oh, yes, and then, so let's go back to Louise Wells' paper. So SVC, so if it was above the nipple line, 381, no cases of meningococcal. But they all looked well, and they had a mechanical cause for it. So there probably is something in that. I suspect if they look well and they have particular rash that's anywhere that's not spreading in front of you, over a period of time, and again, that will hopefully come out in the study. It's probably not a big difference whether it's above the nipple line or not. I think we like that, that message, that teaching. I think it's a truth that we pass on. There's lots of clicks for some reason to get this one. There we go. So, another statement for you just to see what you think. All children with fever and non-blanching rash require blood tests. Oh, wow. 100% disagree. Okay. Okay. Someone's going to go, what about ITP? And that's going to come up, I know, but let's see. Right, 38, 40%. So it's really interesting. So, uh, again, I don't know the answer. I'm only going to tell you my opinion, and I've actually changed my opinion and practice and views of things over, over the course of the study. So it's not that I know as such. It's just interesting to see what people think. So, again, we're really split on this, which would fit with what we're seeing. Because actually, although I said you don't follow the guidelines, some of you don't follow the guidelines the other way. So if we go through it and follow NICE all the way through to low risk, there's still a number, of, a reasonable number of children that you, you will treat, even though technically, according to NICE guidance, you could withhold treatment. 
So, so we're, we're the way we interpret guidance, interpret risk, and manage patients is very, very different. Um, and it has to be to a certain extent. That's what makes us doctors and not machines. So these dots, there's 326 and a half dots, because I put them on there. Um, these are like, this is to represent the group of children that have a rash that doesn't spread who look well. So that's why it's 653 and not 800 odd. So that if they looked unwell, we've taken that off. So this is well children who have petechiae, have any distribution, but it's not spreading in the time in the, in the A&E. The two red dots are invasive infections, so the ones I can't make up. So one is pneumococcal infection, and one was an E. coli infection on a young infant. So that young infant probably would have been picked up through other ways, the fact they were a young infant in the study. The one patient is the one case of ITP that, that didn't have a spreading rash. So we had three cases of ITP, two of them, you would, the fact that the rash was rapidly developing. So I'll leave that with you to decide whether or not that one case of ITP is worth 653 blood tests. I am not telling you I, either way, so don't attack me. I just, that's there. So I know we're kind of pushing time. So that's the clinical stuff. And, and there's more and more, there's so much more clinical stuff I could pull out. And it's been hard to pick what I go for for today. But in this study, CRP demonstrated a good diagnostic accuracy for invasive bacterial infections. What do you think? Is that a true or false? 100% think it's false. Is it working? Does no one think it's true? Oh, that, that's, that's, just a, that's just like a sympathy vote, isn't it? That was just... <laughs> right, okay, so... This is, I'm going to enjoy this next bit, I think. Stop, I better stop talking. Right, because I'm not going to let you change. So, we have a very difficult relationship with biomarkers. We treat them very badly, okay? So CRP, this is a rock curve. So a rock curve is clinically useless to you, but it's a nice, fair way to compare biomarkers. And I won't go into that, but I could. Um, and essentially, it's looking at a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity over a wide range of values for a particular condition, and in this case, invasive infections, not just meningococcal, all of those invasive infections that we listed. And then we are an area under the curve, which is what you compare between tests, of 0.84. That is very, very good for a biomarker. So it did show a really good diagnostic accuracy. Um, so it's a great test, but it's not. So it's, and I don't like it, and I rarely use it, and I don't think we need to use it regularly. And this is the reason why. We use CRP when we do a diagnostic accuracy study. Everyone has a CRP, okay, and then we report the accuracy. So it's a bit like getting, uh, let's imagine for a second now, we've created the non-blanching rash t you know, dynamic duo, Batman and Robin. You're Batman as the doctor, and CRP's Robin, if you like. And Robin went away and did all his ninja training on diagnosing meningococcal. And, and he's come back and said, I'm really good. I'm 0.84 accuracy at picking up meningococcal. Let me go and identify it as much as possible right now. Batman. And you say, no, I'm Batman. You're Robin. I'm going to see all the kids. And anyone that looks unwell, it doesn't matter about what you think. I'm going to treat them. Okay? Anyone that's got purpura, doesn't matter what you think. I'm going to treat them. Anyone that rashes spread, doesn't matter what you think. I'm going to treat them but I'll send you everyone else. What? I'm going to send you 800 kids. Only one of them is going to have meningococcal, and I want you to find them now. Okay, but don't miss anyone, because I'm using you as the last line of defense. Okay, and that's, that's not what we've actually reported on the diagnostic accuracy. If that was a colleague or, or someone else working on a team, that wouldn't be fair on them, and that's how we use biomarkers. We, we assess them on like a whole population, and then we use them completely differently. And then we go back and we say, I can't believe you thought that was meningococcal. You know, that's obviously not meningococcal. And then the flip side, how many of you have treated someone, looked up the CRP and seen it was six, and gone, well, it looks sick, so CRP can lag? <laughs> so it works both ways. You know, if Robin comes back in and says, Batman, you got that one wrong, we just think, we say, nah, you just, you're not quick enough. I'm a bit quicker. I pick it up a bit quicker. So CRP is a really accurate test, and I think some of the other biomarkers will always have this problem. If we research them in one way with one population and use them in a completely different way, it's not gonna, it's, we're going to hate it. So additional biomarkers, so I haven't got time to talk about it now, but we have looked at point-of-care testing for meningococcal on throat swabs. Looks very accurate. Again, I could discuss where that might fit in. Small numbers, it's very expensive. I can't afford to send it to everywhere. Procalcitonin, the headline's going to be that it's not really much better than CRP, but small numbers. It's really how we use the biomarkers, not the biomarker itself, I think. So finally, I know I'm like a minute over, sorry. I just, we could have done Mr. Mischief was the other one, Spot of Trouble. I thought that would be the other book we could have done. This is, where, this is really good. Have anyone read this? They're kids. He gets measles. Um, 
and he paints over the measles spots and goes around and gives everyone measles. It's brilliant. So um, <laughs> anyway, so my take home for you is it hasn't gone away. Meningococcal hasn't gone away. People tell me that I worry too much about meningococcal and non-blanching rashes and its other serious infections. That is not true. The main difference between febrile kids with a non-blanching rash and febrile kids is meningococcal, and it kills children still. If you're not going to follow the guidelines, treat everyone with purpura. Do not take risk with purpura and an intercurrent illness. Um, and coming off the fence, I don't think, now I'm going to just say this, I don't think that children who are well, who have a petechiae only that aren't spreading in front of you, need painful procedures routinely. I would allow you some judgment because you're clinicians, but I don't think it needs to be an automatic thing that we do. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got lots of support from lots and lots of people there on the screen just for time, but thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Some really interesting and relevant take-home messages on an illness that scares all of us. Um, now, we've got some time for questions. I'll go to Joe first to see what we've got from Twitter. Yeah, it's been busy. Uh, <laughs> it's one clearly people are passionate about. So Edward Snelson asks, is it time for us in the UK to move towards ignoring petechiae altogether in the child who has been febrile but has no signs of sepsis? Fever plus petechiae equals meningococcal infection until proven otherwise was relevant in the last millennium. Um, so... I would have said that before I did the PIC study. I came in thinking that meningococcal was almost impossible to spot in the first 12, 24 hours, like Ezra. You come in with a non-blanching rash, and by the time you have a non-blanching rash, it's too late. It's obvious. What we've seen from the study is that it's not actually the case. And again, we'll have to look at this, but certainly with vaccinations, there's maybe a slight change in what we're seeing. So some of the children aren't as sick. So that you can have meningococcal and not need to go to intensive care, not need inotropes, and not be very sick on arrival. We've had one case of a child that was discharged, who was thought to be well, despite having a purpuric mark, um, who reattended and, and was sick. So I think we need to be really vigilant, and we need to understand a bit better what we're doing. So not all non-blanching rashes are equal. I would say all purpura in the presence of an intercurrent illness is meningococcal until proven otherwise. I would move it to purpura. But yes, I agree. I think a well child with a particular rash that isn't spreading at all, I would treat them as though they are in the same group as any other child that comes in with a febrile illness. I don't know if that's a long answer, but I hope that makes sense. If not, someone call me out on it again now, and I'll try and clarify it. Thank you. We also have a question from David Sinton. Can we clarify by intercurrent illness? Do we mean febrile illness? Because purpura and joint swelling or purpura and abdo pain could be considered an illness but fits with classical HSP. Yeah, so I was being deliberately vague, thank you. Um, so uh, <laughs> the study talks about fever. So you have to have a fever or a history of fever. And that's because you have to define a study a population. It's really, I do not want 37 sites, a couple of hundred emails a day, go, does this count, does this count, does this count? We have to be transparent. So for the study, it's fever or history of fever. For you as a clinician, I would go a little bit further. Fever is not always well recorded. We've excluded children because they haven't got um, fever in the study. We've got one case of excluded meningococcal wear because it reached 37.9, not 38. So I would say to you, if you have an intercurrent illness, and by that I would mean you know, a febrile illness, viral illness, you feel like they've got a bug. And most of you will know what that means and what that feels like, I hope. So if they have come in with a bug and they have purpura, I'm, going to say, I'm just going to keep saying this, give them antibiotics. <laughs> um, that's, that's, the, that's, what I, that's how I would define it. But for the study, it's fever or history of fever of 38 or higher. More questions? Um, so we'll take questions from the floor. I'm happy to take questions for all of our speakers, um, not just for Tom, because I know there were some, some additional questions uh, specifically for Kerry before. My question is for Tom. Um, <laughs> Do you think we'll get a guideline out of this study? Uh, we've been debating at our hospital around guidelines. You just told us that people don't follow the guidelines um, and that here's some guidelines, but I think you all know what a well child is. You all know what a bug is. It's these definitions that are really we struggle with at our hospital. So mo a lot of guidelines, this one and other diseases, they start with well child, sick child. And so that can be, like most of us, we say we know what that is, but when we've got a group of junior trainees, some are adult trainees doing their peds time, some are less experienced than others, 
that's where it really falls down. And I think that's, do you have any views on whether all the great information you're finding will lead to a guideline that will be useful and people will follow? So, so the, the, I, I, that's a great question, and there's, more, there's a few parts to it, if that's okay. So I'm going to try and pull them apart. Uh, first of all, we won't create a new guideline from this. I need to be honest about that. We haven't got enough uh, cases. And to, to actually, that's a good thing, because of vaccination. To, to create a new guideline from scratch, we worked out we'd need in and around 40,000 children, which based on the number of sites and recruitment we've got, we'd be running this study for in on the, you know, five years, a decade, whatever. It wouldn't be feasible. So what we will do is validate the different guidelines that you've already created. Because to create a, create a guideline needs a lot more patience than it does for me to take something you're already doing and test it. So what I'm hoping to do is come out and validate and come down on one of, your, one of the guidelines that you guys are using. In terms of wellness, I would love to look more into wellness, and it's not something that's easy to do. Um, but certainly, we're very cautious in what we think is well. So being defined as unwell in the study carries about a five-fold increase in your risk of having you know, an invasive infection. Um, having purpura is about a 50-fold increase in your risk. Having a raised CRP at 150 is like a 30 times risk. So we, we do tend to be quite cautious. And I think I always try and remind myself of wellness and go back to that work from Brogan and well, um, Louise Wells and things. That ill criteria that from all those years ago, irritable, lethargic, long cat refill of five seconds. These guys were really kind of, you know, they were tough back then. You had to have a cat refill of five seconds to be, you know, defined as shock. So in short, I think wellness, yes, I agree, it's really hard. If, you, if you're supervising someone and they tell you they're well or unwell and you, you can't see them, that's tricky. And you may well come down on the side of caution, and that's fine. But we tend to be quite careful, I think, with wellness. We probably define more children as unwell than they are, compared to at least when these first studies were performed. Hi there. A uh, question for Tom again, sorry. Um, just in terms of your invasive bacterial infections, the meningococcals, um, have we typed them at all? Um, I only ask because from many years out in Australia, I didn't see much meningococcal at all. Back in the UK, seeing a lot more of it. I'm just wondering if the types uh, you're getting in the UK are different. We're, we're still, what we're seeing is men be still at the minute overwhelming. That might change over the next, um, next few years because actually... You, you, one of the reasons for the timing now is meningococcal rates are very, very low. The expectation is, and the hope is with meningococcal B vaccine, is that they will continue to fall again, um, and we will see even lower rates, which is why we're doing it at the minute. But yeah, we're still seeing predominantly meningococcal B. Any more questions? All right. Well, that's perfect timing because it's lunch now for the next hour. Thank you, everyone, and thank you again to uh, Marielle, Kerry, and Tom. <laughs>